Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. People in the audience did say Happy Mother's Day, just so y'all know. All right, let's begin our morning by reading the scripture, Psalm 31, 1 through 3. Lord, I have come to you for safety. Don't let me ever be put to shame. Save me because you do what is right. Pay attention to me. Come quickly to help me. Be the rock I go to for safety. Be the strong fort that saves me. You are my rock and my fort. Lead me and guide me for the honor of your name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for our moms. We thank you for those that act like our moms. Lord, just be with us today. Help us to open our eyes, our hearts, our ears to the things that you would have us here today. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's begin our worship as we sing, Come, now is the time to worship. this morning. It's good to see some of our people back in the, in the sanctionasium this morning. Let's continue in our worship as we sing a shelter in the time of storm. Jesus is a rock in a weary bed. 
Father, I just thank you so very much for your presence here with us this day. Lord, I just know that you have a special blessing for each that is gathered here this day. And I just pray that you'd be with those that are watching at home. Lord, that you would just grant them a special uh, presence, a, a sense of your presence this morning in a great and mighty way. God, we have gathered together, whether we're here in this building or whether we're home watching on Facebook, we have gathered because you alone are worthy of our praise and our worship. You alone are the Holy One, the Almighty One, the One who is filled with love and grace and mercy, the One who has given us the opportunity to return into fellowship with You by having our sins forgiven and having our fellowship restored through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. O oh Lord, that we might have the faith to believe and to trust in Jesus for our salvation, both here and forevermore. Now, Lord, as we have gathered this day, we do so to hear your word, your word that would be proclaimed through your scriptures. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to set aside everything that would hinder us from hearing that word, that word of comforting and encouragement, that word of challenge. Lord, we give you the praise. We give you the honor and the worship. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. Well, this is a very special day. It is Mother's Day, and we're glad we can have the church reopened on this special day, Mother's Day. And so I'd like to take an opportunity to pay tribute to our mothers. And so, Talina, come forward and, and share with us, if you would, please. All right. If you are a mother, I would love for you to stand right now. And if you're home, raise your hand. All right. We have lots of mothers here this morning, and I know we have many more that are watching um, on, on live this morning. And right now, before I read some scriptures, Tim is going to pray for all the mothers, and then you can be seated after he prays. We thank you so very much for your presence here with us this day. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you would indeed bless each and every mother that is here present and those that are hearing my voice and those that uh, are, are not able to be here. And, and I just pray, God, that you would bless each and every one of our mothers and our mother figures in our lives because they are the rock. They are the foundation for our faith and for our belief in Jesus Christ. And so, God, I just pray that, uh, again, on this special day, that we would honor them. And, Lord, that we would not just honor them on this special day, but that we would remember that we are to honor our mothers all the time, every day, in every way. So, again, on this special day, a special blessing for these, our mothers, in our present it's this morning and watching over uh, live on Facebook. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may Amen. be seated. seated. Amen. Okay, at the back, as you leave today, you will see a cute little piece of paper, and it has some verses on it that are words of encouragement from God's Word for mothers. On Mother's Day, we want you to use these eight verses to remember the truth of God's Word and His promises for your life. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of them. And what this is trying to get us to do is to remember that mothers are very, very important in the life of your family. Mothers are the ones that teach things that no one else does. So if the mother is grounded in faith, if the mother has Jesus in her life and acts the way that Jesus would want her to, then the family does grow up in God's word. So one of the verses that's on here is, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That is such a good thing to know. That is such a great thing to know. Um, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. 
When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Okay, so again, mothers, study the word. Be the God in your family that your children can follow, that your children can watch, that your children can be like. So make sure your heart is where it's supposed to be so that you can teach the children and the others that watch you. There's other people that watch you, not just your own kids, not just your own family. So be Jesus to all of them. All right, happy Mother's Day, and I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful day. All right, uh, just a couple of announcements. First of all, um, we uh, will be taking up, and we will not be taking up an offering, but we do have a basket at the back of the sanctuary. As you leave, you can place your offering in there. If you didn't bring your offering with you this morning, obviously you can continue to give on uh, on Givelify, the app that you, is available on your phone and it's available online. Uh, also, you can mail your checks in, and you can always set up uh, bill pay through your bank, and they'll send a check to the church that way. So there's several different opportunities to keep your tithes and offerings coming in. Uh, the church, even though we haven't had activities going on, we still have had things happening to where we have to keep our expenses up. And uh, I hope you've been watching some of uh, Talina's videos that she's been putting out for the preschool. Uh, that's kind of a fun thing, and you're, you're getting to see more of the preschool during these past eight weeks than you ever have before because you see the circle times and the Bible stories that she does every week. And it's not just her, but every teacher does that circle time in their classroom just like that. So it, it's kind of a neat thing. Um, we also have a dime a day uh, bucket set up at the back. We won't have the kids take up the offering, but if you have an offering, loose change, pocket change, that you want to give to dime a day missions in support of uh, uh, Solomon and Anita and Amori Fay Ministries in Honduras, you can give uh, this morning through that. So we have two giving opportunities for you as you leave, or uh, if you want to just do it now so that you're not forgetful and that you are having in mind that you're going to give, you can do it right now. That's fine with me. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that's that. We will meet together. Oh, I, I thought about picking the camera up and just scanning the whole audience that you see that there's over 30 people here this morning, and we are spread out throughout the gym, but I thought maybe there's someone here that might not want to be on Facebook, so, so I'm not going to do that this morning. So, but it's, a, it's fun to be able to meet in the Lord's house and to have people here uh, present, and uh, we just give Him the glory. Let's just pray one more time as we prepare to go to the Lord and, and, and study His Word together. Heavenly Father, we just thank You for this privilege we have of coming together and honoring and worshiping you and hearing your word to us corporately. Uh, it's always good to read your word daily, privately, in our private devotions, but there's also a grace that is given to us and we come together and we fellowship together and we uh, are able just to have this time of, of fellowship and and read your word and study it together. So we thank you for that. And I just pray your blessing upon us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That does remind me of one other thing. When you are dismissed and when we are dismissed, feel free to stay in here and visit at a distance so that we're not down the hallway and into a smaller area. So then that way as you're beginning to leave, we can all leave kind of one family at a time from here after the time that you're finished uh, having visitation and fellowship here uh, this morning. We do have some papers available. I saw some of you pick those up. They're little pink papers. Hold yours up there, Maeve. Okay, pink papers that are available, uh, especially for the kids. But hey, if some of the rest of you want to take notes, you're, you're, you can get one. And uh, you can follow along with those as well this morning. Uh, just to have those as an opportunity. Um, Excuse me for a minute while I set up the slides. I have only two slides, but I got to get them ready. Didn't have my offertory to do this, Don. I guess you could play some music for me. No, I'm just kidding. That's not necessary. Um, 
Here we go. All right. This morning the scripture is from 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17. So if you have your Bibles, I'm not going to... 1 Kings, excuse me, 1 Kings. And that is correct, 1 Kings. 1 Kings 17. <clears throat> we do have Bibles available for you on a cart. They're back over in this corner this morning if you don't have a Bible. Uh, obviously, you can follow along on your uh, phones with your Bible apps. I know everyone has a Bible app on their phone, right? If not, I can suggest some for you. There's some great ones available. 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17, we are going to look this morning at a woman of faith. No, Elijah is not the woman of faith. The widow of Zarephath is the widow or the lady of faith that we're going to look at this morning. This woman in Scripture doesn't start out as a woman of faith, however, um, but she ends up as a woman of faith, and that's where we need to start this morning because, hear this, whoever you are, Whatever your faith is like, just remember that a person of great faith starts out as a person of somewhat smaller faith, right? I mean, I know that's obvious when you think it through, but we all start out with small amounts of faith and we gradually grow our faith and we become people and men and women, especially this morning, of great faith. It's obvious when we, we think about it, but sometimes I think we just expect our faith to be there. And sometimes I think when we think, man, I don't have enough faith, we're going, what's wrong? Where's my faith? Well, it may need to start small and grow. And that's what we see happening with this widow of Zarephath. What you need to know is this, God can still work His plan in your life right now, even if you don't have great faith right now, as we will see in this passage that we're looking at. So, 1 Kings 17, I'm not going to read the entire thing because it's really the, the rest of the chapter, but we'll look at it as a few verses as we go down through here, and I'll just kind of tell the story as we go along. The land of, uh, in which they lived, this is the setting, the land in which they lived was in a great drought. Hadn't had rain in three and a half years at this point, and Elijah, up until this point, had been isolated by the Kirith, in the Kirith Ravine. Isolated. Sounds familiar, right? Uh, the, the Kirith Creek uh, was a small tributary that ran into the Jordan River. And so God had sent Elijah to this place, and he was uh, getting water from the creek, and ravens were bringing him uh, food as he waited out this drought that was in the land. So he was alone. He was isolated. He was being taken care of by birds and by nature. And at this point, the creek dries up. And when it does, God says to him, okay, it's time to do something different. So in verse 8, we, well, in verse 7, we read, 1 Kings 17, 7, Sometime later, the brook dried up because there was, uh, had not been any rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, now we're going to stop right there for a second. Zarephath, where in the world is this? Well, it is in that region, as it says, of Sidon, uh, which would have been uh, in present-day Lebanon. Okay, so this woman wasn't uh, necessarily a Jew. In fact, she probably was not a Jew. Uh, she was... Uh, uh, from the, uh, a person from the area north of the, the Israel land and the land of the, the Jews at the time. Uh, it's interesting to note that Kareth, let's just back up a second, Kareth, where he had been staying, stands for separated. Just the name of the, the brook, the, the creek where he had, meant separated. Identifies perfectly with his situation. He had been alone. No human contact for an extensive, extensive period of time. Again, <laughs> kind of like what we have been going through. So God sends him to Zarephath. 
which means, Zarephath means fiery trial. Interesting. Fiery trial. So in, in a sense, God is calling him out of the frying pan into the fire, out of a place of isolation. It's just kind of a play on words. He's ready to go, and he's walking to Zarephath, and can, can, can you just imagine what he's thinking? Oh, my goodness, what has God got in store for me here? I mean, if he's been taking uh, care of me at the brook uh, this way, at the creek this way, what has he got planned for me later? Notice that God doesn't give him much to go by. God's really kind of light on details here. Verse 9 says, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So what is this woman's name? How's he going to find her? What's she going to be wearing? Where does she live? Will I know her when I see her? Does she have a criminal record? I mean, what, all the things that's going through his mind, possibly. What would be going through your mind? Go to this place, find this lady. She's going to take care of you. Don't know her name. Does God ever do this to you? Not direct you to go to some place like this and have a widow take care of you, but does he ever lead you down the path not giving you all the details up front? I would say he does that to us more than we can imagine. He probably does it more than we think he does. See, life's moving along, you're doing your own thing, and bam, out of the blue something happens, and you say, God, what's going on? And all of a sudden you're in the middle of this situation or this thing that you're in, and you don't know why God has you there or why God has put you there. It's kind of what's going on with Elijah. We kind of see that with the prophet Jonah, right? We know the story of Jonah. We don't, Jonah was not given many details because Jonah may have chickened out if God had told him all the details. Chickened out anyway and ran. God had to supply a big fish to swallow him to bring him back home. But here's Elijah. Elijah's different than Jonah. He's a bold, confident, strong, faithful um, man of God. And, 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 he, and he usually does whatever God asks him to do. So why does he not give him the details? And I want us to think about this because God doesn't always give us the details. Well, sometimes he's silent because we are like Jonah. And we refuse to walk in faith, and we would refuse to walk in faith if we knew what was coming. I mean, actually, it's not walking in faith if you know what's coming. Sometimes God's silent because in His awesome power, He wants to reveal it to us slowly. Sometimes the, the time spent waiting will intensify the impact of God's work in our lives when He does work. Sometimes the wait will make us more ready to receive God's Word. But the truth is, as I've already kind of indicated, if we have the details in advance then we wouldn't be walking in faith. So, Elijah must walk by faith, alone, with minimal details, to Seraphith, his fiery trial. And when he gets there, it says, at the gate he finds a woman of faith. At the gate! What I love about this is that he doesn't have to go looking for her. The woman is right there at the gate. He doesn't have to look her up on Facebook. He doesn't have to go to Google Maps to find her house. She's there! At the the gate picking up sticks it says so that she can build a fire to make the last meal for her and her son you know we want the details of our circumstances from God up front but God supplies the details as we walk in faith as we step out and as we re re uh, arrive where God has directed us and there the details will be right in front of us. So here we have this woman gathering sticks. Verse 10. So, when, uh, so he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a, what, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar that I might have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece 
of bread. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, stop a second. Now, in their custom, it was not unusual for someone to ask a woman for water to drink. It was a customary thing to happen. And in fact, it would have been rude. It would have been um, unspeakable. It would have been shameful if this woman had refused to get water for Elijah to drink after he had asked. And we find this years later, Jesus sitting by a will asking a woman for a drink. We find it earlier when Jacob is by a well asking for water to drink. And so it's something that happened often. And, and so it, it's not uncommon. And she's ready and willing to do this because that's her obligation. That's the way that the Middle Eastern countries of this time, uh, it was the hospitable thing to do. But as she's walking off to get his water, he throws in the hook, as it were. And says, Anne, could you please bring me some bread? Whoa. Now he's asking something very, very, very deep. Because we read on. It says, verse 12, As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. She says, I tell you the truth. And it's almost as if she's, she's swearing by God, I, you know, in, a, in a good way, saying, I, I swear by the Lord your God, I'm telling the truth, I don't have any bread, she says. She says, in fact, I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we might eat it and die. All she has is a handful of flour. Hold your hand out like this. How much flour is going to be in that handful? I mean, can you get a full cup in there? I doubt it. Maybe some of you guys with big hands might can get a cup of flour in there. I don't know if you scoop it up there and hold. Probably half a cup, third a cup, whatever. Not much flour. That's all she has. That's all she has. Is that going to be enough to make enough bread for her and her son? Wow, she's going to have to really stretch it. But Elijah comes to her, asks for a drink, and he says, Oh, and by the way, can you bring me some bread? You understand what he's asking for? He's asking for full commitment from her. He's asking for all she has. All she has. Isn't that what God asks of us? All that we have? See, I remember reading somewhere in the New Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. I also remember reading someplace in the New Testament, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. We sing the hymn, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. Another hymn that we should sing, I don't know that we actually do sing here, is, is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid. All we're saying is that what God asks of us is our all. Didn't I preach a sermon series on all in not long ago? Are we all in for God? That's what he's asking of this woman. So who is this woman? We don't even know her name. All we know is that she's a, a single mom trying to make it, and it doesn't look like she's going to make it. She's desperately trying to take care of her son. It's clear that she cannot provide even for him. Um, usually there would be a widow that um, uh, would have a family to take care of her. Many times a brother of her husband would marry the widow, so that she would at least have uh, a, a say and some place to, to, to be in a family. Evidently, this lady didn't have any of that. And if she dies, she's not going to be noticed. And if she, uh, she must be, as being a woman, she's of low social standing. Being a widow, she has no social standing. So she's a nobody, a phantom among her neighbors. They don't know who she is. And she's a non person, she's a non entity 
But even she, even she, in the limited resources that she has, can make a difference and grow her faith. She literally has nothing, is nobody, and yet God says you can do great things. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 10 says, This is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. Did you hear that? He said, I delight in those things. <laughs> you delight in those things? Do you delight in weakness and insults, hardships, persecutions? We're quick to go, no, I've got rights. It goes on to say, for when I am weak, then I am strong. You see what's happening here? Do you understand what God is setting up for both the woman and for Elijah? Let, let me ask you this. If God operates this way in the lives of people in the Bible, why wouldn't you expect him to act differently towards you? Isn't he the same God? Can't he take our little and make it much? Can't he take the faith that we do have and grow it into a greater faith? If it's weakness that this woman has, then that's going to make her strong if she will apply her faith. If it's weakness that the Apostle Paul had, then that was what was going to make him strong. Why is it so hard to believe the weakness of our lives was going to make us strong? Because we don't have faith. Where is your faith? Build on your faith. What do you need for God to use you in powerful ways? Think about that. What do you need for God to use you in powerful ways? And the answer is a weakness. Not the answer you expect, is it? Because when we're weak, then we're strong. Because when we're weak, we understand we cannot do it on our, by ourselves. We cannot do it anymore in our own strength that we have to depend upon God. We've got to let God. Let God have His way in our life. And so I come to... Oh, I knew that might happen. Oh, there we go. Let God. Let God. Let that just... We're just going to leave that up there. Because that's what we need to do. When we are weak, we are strong when we let God work in our lives. Now, say, but does this lady, who we don't even know the name of, really have any faith? Well, look at what she says. Didn't she say, as surely as your God lives? Right there, she's acknowledging that she understands there's a God that Elijah is worshiping. And so there's a little bit of a, okay, there's a God. She acknowledges that there is a God, and that's the start. And then in verse 15, she went away, verse 15, she went, well, let, let me just read this a little bit. 13, verse 13. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. Go home, make that last meal for you and your son. But first, he says, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make uh, some more for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. Verse 15, So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. Whoa. Do you see her? you see the leap that she made? I mean, she very had little faith at all, and now she's, she's going over hurdles. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do what you said. I'm going to go home. I'm going to make that bread for you. And then I'm going to go home. And if there's any left, I'm going to make it for my son. And the rest of the story is 
there was enough for her and for her son. And the next day there was enough for Elijah and for her and for her son. And the next day there was enough for Elijah and for her and for her son. And the next day and the next day and the next day. And there was always just enough to provide for their needs. Because she, she allowed her and let her faith to grow. She went from a person of probably the of least faith in her town, thinking, my last meal, I'm going to make a fire and make some bread, and my son and I are going to eat it, and that's going to be our last meal, and then we're going to die. She goes with having hardly any faith at all to being the person with the greatest faith in town in a blink of an eye, and that is an awesome epic situation. God asked uh, for the impossible. God asked for the impossible through Elijah. And he asked that Elijah be fed first and the rest is history. She must give away what she had first. In all logic and, 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 and anything that made sense, she was choosing death for herself and for her son by giving. But God defies our logic. We see our faith as holding on, but God sees our faith as letting go. Oh, did you hear that? We see our faith of hope. You ask a person, how you doing? And they say, oh, I'm just holding on, which means that by faith, they're just barely hanging on in life. It's a struggle, but they're hanging on. But God doesn't want us just to hang on. He wants us to let go. Because it's when we let go that God can truly work in our lives. So what if I were to change this and drop the D in God What would happen? Nothing? There we go. <laughs> you drop the D and it becomes let go. Let go of what you have so that God can bless it and honor it and use it for your plan and for the plan of others, for your blessing and for the blessing of others. Hear what the words of... Elijah were, do not be afraid. For God has a plan. And he wants you to be right dab in the middle of that epic plan. So let go. Just quit holding on to what you have. Let it go so God can use it and build your faith. And I know. Who among us is willing to do that? Who among us is is ready to give up all that we have? But that's the commitment that's asked for. That's the all-in that God is asking for from us. So instead of holding on, instead of holding tight to the last thing she has, she's to let go. And upon letting go, she gets God's blessing. Now, i got to tell you where I got this, let God let go. I actually got that from my good friend, Phil Brooks, in the Pacific Northwest last night on my phone call from him in which he prays for me and for you every Saturday night. I was telling him the message that I was preaching this morning and he says, you know, back years ago I had a sermon and I had a placard and I had let God on it. And as I was talking about let God in your lives, let God work in your lives, he said, but really what it comes to, and he says, and what I did is I took the O away, I mean the D away rather, took the D away, and it becomes let go. Phil Brooks, thank you for this sermon illustration of how we need to let go so that we can move forward. Now, it's one thing to say that we believe. It's another thing that takes action on that belief. It's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to leave this place and I'm going to let go. It's another thing to leave this place and actually let go. Some of us uh, have been thinking about our faith for a long time. Do you have faith? 
Have you lost your faith? What does it feel like to have faith, you may be thinking? Some among you are probably hoping that faith will slowly creep in on you. Some of us want to every cotton-picking detail of our life spelled out for us, but they say, then I'll have faith. But wait a minute, what kind of faith is that? Some of us are saying, I, I, I just, I don't know. But notice this, God doesn't ask her to do anything out of the ordinary in her life. It's an important part, point for us today. God does not ask her to do anything out of the ordinary in her life. He doesn't ask her to build a great church or to be a missionary or to travel to other places. He doesn't ask her to give up her house, testify to crowds. All he asks for is what she could hold in her hand. Are you willing to give that to me, God says? So the point is, faith isn't about huge projects. It's about everyday life. God uses ordinary, everyday, even sometimes boring things, the been there, done that things of our life to build our faith. Yet, notice that it's a spiritual thing that hits this lady, not a material thing, she has to believe before she takes action. And when she believes, she takes action, and the rest is history. So let's review. This woman wasn't much of a noteworthy person. Don't even know her name. She didn't have much to offer. But she gave what she had. And it made all the difference in her life. Remember what Paul said. For when I am weak, I am strong. Now, why this message on Mother's Day? Because it is a great example to us as to how we, you, as mothers, can take what you have and by faith be a blessing to others. In your ordinary lives, in your ordinary day-to-day -day routine of what you do, whatever it is, however ordinary or mundane or hard or boring it may seem, God can use you to bless others. And when you do, he blesses you. All the rest of us, the same thing. Right, guys? Right, those of you who are not mothers? God will bless us. Um, so I don't want you to look at what you don't have. I want you to look at what you have. And be ready to let God, no wait, not let God be willing to let go. And by letting go, you are exercising faith. And God can use you in great ways. Father God, I just thank you so very much for being with us this day. For being a blessing to our mothers and Father, I just pray that as we leave this place this day, that you would indeed just uh, bless us as we think in terms of being a people of faith. Maybe we don't have great faith right now, but even people of great faith start with less faith, and it grows. So we have this promise before us that you can build our faith when we let you when we let you, God, work in our lives and when we let go and let you truly work. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and we, as we close our time together by singing, Take My Life. Take My Life. The chorus is great. I love this chorus. Take my heart. Take my uh, informant. Take my mind. Transform it. Take my will. Conform it to yours. To yours. This is the dedication of giving your all, the commitment of giving your all to God.
business is what you want from me. God, as we leave this place today, we ask your blessing to be upon us. Lord, that we would be one who lets God work in our life so that we can let go of what we have, that he can bring a blessing to others and a blessing to ourselves. Father God, we just love you and we honor you. We give you the praise and the glory. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. You are dismissed. Remember, there are papers available for the mothers at the back. Uh, offering can be placed in the basket at the back, dime a day, and the container on the chairs. And feel free to visit in the room uh, before we leave on out into the hallway, at a distance, of course. <laughs>